What are you doing? Awesome. I get, you, I get you at the end of the day. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? Hey, I need a ride later. Just checking. Yeah, just down to the, the airport in London, if you don't mind. All right. Do you want this? I'm going to leave this door open. Is that all right? Yeah. Two reasons. Number one, it's a little cooler. And number two, everybody gets to hear what I'm saying because I'm kind of um, egocentric that way. Hey, how's it going? You're not late. Have a seat. Ain't you? Anywhere's fine. Splash zone is up here. Yeah. 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 No, seriously. Sit by Marco. He's awesome. He's got like the shirt on in case you get sick or something. He looks like a nurse. He's got the candy striper shirt. It's all good. Okay. Uh, my name is Buck Woody. I'm a senior technical specialist at Microsoft. Are we ready to start, camera guy? Um, all right. I feel like I'm on one of those infomercials now. And all you guys have to go, it is tastier than the competition. Um, that said it and forget it. Um, all right, I'm a senior technical specialist uh, at Microsoft, even though some people are ashamed to admit that, uh, that I still work there. I do. Um, I also teach at the University of Washington, which is just um, that way, a little ways. And I teach a data science course there and, and a database course. Uh, so I work on that. So we're going to be talking today about designing. Hi, come on in. Have a seat. No worries. Just cross right in front of the camera. It's all cool. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You might want to sit right down. All right, I'm supposed to mention a whole bunch of stuff. So let me get my script here. A um, couple things. Um, fill out the feedback. Uh, whatever the high score is, what you want to put for in here, that guarantees you a prize. Also, um, you get a ticket if you fi uh, fill one of those out. Network and stick around for free drinks until 7 tonight. Wow. And you get a, a Redgate goodie bag. I don't know what that means. A T-shirt and a sequel book. So awesome stuff. All right. We're going to be talking about designing um, systems, hybrid systems for the enterprise today. Hi. Come on in. I'll talk to her. Who is she? Is it your wife? Sorry, who is it? No, seriously. I'll talk to her. I have talked to people's wives from the podium, so you may want to. Um, you do need to have the uh, uh, mindset of at least a 17-year-old and younger uh, because this will represent a different way of thinking about things today. Okay? I just want to set expectation for what we're doing. Um, first of all, um, the elements that we'll include today will be technical language, new concepts, uh, brief humor, and frequent web links. So let me go over each of these real quick. I will be talking in technical terms. I'm not going to stop and explain what a database is or whatever. If I don't, uh, if I say something you don't understand, it's okay to say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's all cool. We're all among friends here. We all promise not to laugh at each other. Do we agree? Good. What's a database again? No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, there are new concepts and architectures here, and they're actually not new. They're stuff we've covered before in technology and we'll cover again. All right? There's also humor. Um, is anybody easily offended in the room? Anybody easily offended? Good. Stick around. Um, I need you later. Um, <laughs> And I will have a web link. There's way more information on each one of these slides uh, than, than I can possibly cover. Hi, come on in. Just go right across the camera field there. It's all cool. I'll let him get settled. That is a cool bag, though. I like your bag. Where'd you get it? Uh, right here. Very cool. I like that one. They have a picture of it? Oh, I now have a picture of it. Yeah. And, and you. Seems like they could get a better model. But what are you going to do, right? Uh, all right. I will have a web link at the bottom of each slide because the concept itself that I'm going to cover is richer and deeper than we're able to do in here. All right, so I want to get through. It's quite a bit, actually, we're going to go through. So scribble these down as we go. Taking notes is part of what you do um, to learn. And I will bring the information, and you'll learn it. That's our contract. Make sense? Yes, sir. OK, sounds good. Um, there will also be, a, a, this is going to be a conceptual topic, meaning we're not going to be typing code or anything like that. I will be covering hyper, hybrid computing concepts. I'll even explain what that means. Um, we'll be using 300 level language. I will be talking in terms of architectural components. And what you're going to end with is a decision point for breaking out an application into multiple parts. Everybody examine this man coming in right now. Do you see that? He did it the right way. He did not walk in front of the camera. Thank you, sir. You're a good man, and you didn't call any attention to yourself by being late. All right. <clears throat> good stuff. Anybody not going here on this particular bus? Because this bus is headed to Chicago, and if that's not where you want to go, there are other fine sessions. Seriously, I'm OK with that. Is everybody OK? Is that what we want to hear today? Anything you were thinking we might cover that I don't have written down here in the bottom part? I'll tell you if we can cover it or not. Anybody have any other interests in this? No? OK, all right. 
Uh, as we go, ask questions. First one, we need to start talking about hybrid, hybrid benefits and challenges. Here's the reference. It's put in the terms of tiny URL, that's all one word, and then 9FFMS3T, and they have a copy of this deck. So this is where you go to learn more about the benefits uh, and challenges within hybrid situations. Um, what we start out with is the fact that we're familiar with this kind of situation right now. We have code that talks to internal systems. That's what we have now. And we might not think we're doing this, but in fact, we're repeating a pattern that we got out of back in the 80s. In the 80s, we came, we're just coming out of the mainframe world where you had uh, various things that were written in certain ways because you had 300 baud modems and a green screen. In other words, you were using Comcast as your home provider. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding, Comcast. Please don't cut me off again. Um, but what we did was we broke all that out and we moved it out into smaller systems that we then tried to regrow up, right? Remember the reason we left the mainframe? We had centralized systems, centralized knowledge, and we had a centralized set of processes that were very brittle, and we had long lead times to get anything done. So we broke that and we said, it's anarchy. Hi, come on in, come on in. May as well do it now, I've seen you. Um, so we broke that apart. We've now got uh, these systems that are running all over the place and everybody's able to do whatever they want. The knowledge is now distributed. You have to be a computer genius. You have to be, no matter what your job is, you now have to know to use Lotus 1, 2, 3, and WordPerfect, and WordStar, and so on. And so we broke that out, and now the implementation times are immediate. But what does all that equal? Anarchy, right? Anarchy, right? Everything's just going nuts. So what did we do? We re-centralized it all. We took one of those computers. We grew it up by throwing more CPUs and memory at it. We grew it up and we made this again. We made a centralized system with brittle processes, centralized knowledge, expensive buildings and rooms and computers, and we have long lead times. We're back, right? I remember when, I, when we left the mainframe, I was working at NASA and we left the mainframe. The reason we were told they were buying PCs everywhere was because it took too long for IT to respond for something. You know what the lead time was? About a month and a half about six weeks. That's how long it took to get something new put through IT. We just didn't have enough people. Sound familiar? <laughs> how quickly can I get something through your organization right now? Six weeks. Never? Is that the way? Okay, never. <laughs> never is good. How about never? Um, so this is what we've got today. We've got patterns now where we've built to where we own the network, we own the computer, and we own the server. I always call them servers in air quotes like that because to me they're just all a big laptop. Matter of fact, they all look like laptops now. All right. And behind those systems uh, was a series of storage. And, and those, this storage becomes terribly important in just a moment. For most of us, that's a SQL Server database. And it is basically the kitchen drawer that you have at your house that you can't quite open. You can open it far enough to see there's string and tape in there. But, and you know there's more stuff in there, but you don't know what it is exactly. You have one of those, or is it just me? Like there's a soul of an old boyfriend from your daughter or something back in there. Maybe your daughter's in there. You can't really tell. All right. So that's what we have today. And we know this is true. Why? Oh, I don't know. File stream, XML data type, blob stores, storing non-structured data in a structured database, right? It's the kitchen drawer. It's the way we're thinking about things. We've got these long lead times, and our users are trying to get work done on disparate devices and with their data coming from multiple locations. And not only is their data coming from multiple locations, it's in multiple kinds of formats. These are different uh, currency symbols, but that's meant to represent. They may even be in different kinds of binary format that we have to figure out. This does not translate to this very well. It's very brittle. Anybody disagree with that statement? Epsidic, yeah, you could even be using that. Um, so we invented what? SSIS. And you now have people who developed in SSIS. God help us all. All they do all day long is just do ETL. Come on in. Come on in. No, it's quite all right. We've had lots of people come in late. I'm kidding with you. You're just the latest one. So you're first among the last. How's that? Plus, you're bigger than me, so I'm going to stop picking on you now. Uh, OK. All right. Hi, come on in. Um, so again, the reference down at the bottom talks more about this. We've got various things we need to consider. 
And we start looking at doing things in a hybrid way. And what do we mean by hybrid to begin with? Well, that will flesh out the rest of the presentation today. And all it means is this. This is Buck Woody's definition of hybrid. You ready? If you're taking notes, doing some or all of a computing need somewhere else. That's it. That's as tough as it gets. I try to keep things very simple. Some or all of a given computer need somewhere else. Now, that matters because we need to talk about what some or all means, and a given need is the big word there because we've got a habit that as technical professionals, we've got to break. All right, but we've got some concerns about this. These are the challenges. Number one, this code does not equal that code. Okay, how many of you know what, and it's okay if you don't, how many of you know what stateless code is? Stateless code, all right? Somebody that raised your hand described me what stateless code is. So you didn't think I was going to ask you, did you? Ah, I'm a college teacher, Skippy. All right, let's go. No worries. No stress. You're not on. You're not on the spotlight. Everybody's not looking at you for the knowledge. You could just say I have Tourette's and I like to raise my hand. You could say. It's, it does execute the same pattern every time. Who else has got something? Self-contained and agnostic. Agnostic of what? Decent. Not bound by a common identifier as being red. You have a state for red and a stateless red. And so you say you're stateless red, you have a state for red. That was a good English sentence. I didn't understand a lot of it. But that's really good. Yes, sir. OK, that's one way to think about it. You're getting closer. You want me to give you an example of a stateless architecture? It's called Walmart. Walmart. So you go to Walmart, and you get in line. And then 1,000 people get in line right before you do. And what do they do? They add another person to the registers, right? And what do you do? You move to that line, which of course has the old lady in it that is paying for everything in pennies from the Hoover administration, right? <laughs> I digress. The point is that each of those people were stateless. Why were they stateless? Why can they just have another cashier come up and start taking your order? Because they're, not tied to that. they're not tied to that particular person because the state is being held where? In the register, in the cash register. All the cash registers work together. The process is the state. It knows where you are at any given moment. The person is immaterial. The person is stateless. If John goes on break and Jane takes over and he's been keying in your items and he, he's moved him to the front and Jane comes up and she just grabs the next item, she knows what to type, stateless. It didn't matter who the person was. If we're writing code the old way and the code disappears, let's take um, uh, Brent Ozar's fame, favorite database, Access. Let's take an application. Let's take an application we've got in access, and you'll start entering some data into it, and then I'll just cut it off. And then I'll turn it back on, and it'll all be good, right? Maybe not, because there was state between me and the device. Now, what you were describing earlier, maybe I've done some things over here, and they've persisted back to the database. If this goes away and wakes back up, they read the state from the database. Perfect. That's the way we need to start thinking. We need to start thinking in stateless. Why do we need to start thinking in stateless architectures? Because if we put all the code as the one smart teller that we own at Walmart, then we're going to get a big line behind that one teller because that's the only one that can service it. We can make her faster. In other words, we can make the computer bigger and more capable, but it doesn't fix anything. We're still not stateless. So the first thing we need to start thinking about is our code needs to start going to stateless architectures. That's a challenge. You've got to rewrite code. Do I have to rewrite code for the new world? You have to rewrite code for the new world. By the way, we used to do this in mainframes all the time. We had to because we had specialized parts of the computer, and they had to talk with each other in a stateless fashion, so they passed messages around. Keep that in your head. Next problem we have is latency. I don't know what kind of network connectivity you have from your house to the interwebs, but sometimes mine's full of LOL cats and gets real slow, and that sucketh mightily. Right, Because what we do when we write a database application, we take locks on things. If Marco wants to uh, buy a plane ticket and he starts buying it and I've got one seat on the plane left and you come in to buy the same seat, I can't show you that seat until I'm sure Marco's done with it. Interesting example because they actually do. You ever gotten to the end of a transaction on the web and it said that's no longer available and you thought they were doing bait and switch? Welcome to stateless programming. 
Okay? We've got these latencies. Did I see a hand go up or just more Tourette's? All right, good stuff. Um, we've got to think about the skills that our developers and our DBAs and our sysadmins and all these specialized knowledge islands we've risen up, we've got to think about how they think. It starts with an architect or somebody acting in an architecture role. And then finally, the big one, security. Man, that stuff's going off somewhere. Where's it being stored? Who's got my data, right? These are real. This is real. Everybody with me? This is the beauty of hybrid being able to have my people work anywhere on anything they want from different data coming from all over the place. Here's the danger. I got to re-architect. There's latency. My people need retraining, and I'm, I'm concerned about security as it goes across the wire. Any questions on this? Anybody see any more hybrid benefits or challenges? Why do we want to do hybrid? Assume for a moment that I ask you to design a system for me. Here's the system. One day a year, people buy a lot of pizza here in the United States of America. Pizza is like food to an American, for those of you not from this country. Um, it's not food, but it's a lot like food. It has same elements and so on. It's just assembled in a different way. The point is that there's one day a year when we sell a lot of pizza here in the U.S. Somebody give me that day. Super Bowl Sunday. This is a lot, um, this is a lot like a sports day in your own country, except it's just contained within our own. And we play a game called football where you use your hands. It's a long story. The point is that on one day, everybody stays home and eats pizza, right? And they eat it all the United States, lots of it, such that I ask you to design a system that could handle the influx of Super Bowl Sunday. What do you think that system looks like? Just throw it out. What do you think? It's huge. Why is it huge? A lot of people buying pizza. OK, good. So what kind of database server do I need? A big one. SQL is the right answer. Sorry. Uh, I work at Microsoft. I got to pay the bill somehow. All right. Uh, how do I do this? I need, uh, say again? Say it again? Distributed. distributed. How do I distribute SQL Server? That's a little hard. Maybe I make the database for pizza for Wisconsin. I make one database for that one and so on. What if people in Wisconsin don't buy as much pizza as people in Texas? How big do I make the servers? Do you guys know? Do you have any idea? Yes, sir. So there is a database for shards. You make shards of databases. How many should I make and where should I put them? It's my choice, but how do I know? How do I know I'm paying for all stuff? The key is I don't know. There's no way to design around this. So you know what you do? You design it once. You design a stateless architecture that can handle one person ordering pizza. And then you tell that, if you get busy, bring another cashier to the register. And if you get busy, bring another cashier to the register. Only it's instead of Walmart, there's thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of computers you can bring to bear if you do it in a stateless way. So this is the only way to solve. Now, by the way, Monday morning, how many people buy pizza? I'll bet this group here could design a pizza system for Super Bowl Sunday. I don't have doubt that you've got the skill to do that. I'm not sure what we would do with the systems Monday morning. Deallocate? Take them back to fries? We're done. We've got a couple of trucks, 300,000 blade servers. So uh, you want me to drive those around back? or? You but, but those boxes, you've bought them. So we're not talking about the hybrid yet. We're talking about how you would do it without hybrid. So that's what we're talking about before that. That's why we're getting there, right, to the cloud, right? OK, so the point is, this is the way you do it. You need some kind of elastic scale. All right, everybody comfortable here, written down the tiny URL? All right, how do we do this? How do we make a hybrid architecture? Number one, begin at the start. Who said that about telling stories? Do you remember the quote? Yeah, begin at the start, go on to the middle, and keep going until you reach the end. Remember that? That's a really good way to go. By the way, um, it was literally a Cicero, I think, that said uh, the most important part of a thing is the start. And it's very true. So you begin at the start. You define your requirements. What do requirements look like? They look like this. The first one in the requirement is you define the reason for the change. Why are you doing something new? Microsoft says that we need to take everything we've got today and move it to the cloud. I hate Microsoft. They're terrible, right? Guess what? Microsoft doesn't want you to do that. That would be a recipe for disaster. There are only two reasons that you ever move anything to the cloud. I hate the word cloud, by the way. It's a bag of gaseous vapor. Only, only a marketing person could sell gaseous vapor as a product. <laughs> it's awesome, and I work in the cloud. All right, there we go. The point is, you need two reasons for a change. One is, number one, ready? 
something's broken. If it's broken, I can help you. We, the people came to us with the pizza example, believe it or not, they did come to us in Azure and say, we have a problem, here's what it is. We don't want to take back 300,000 servers Monday morning. Well, we don't need them the rest of the year, but once a year we can't be without them. What do we do? And we said, we can help you with that, okay? So that's the first thing, they had something broken. Second thing, the only other reason that you would go to, to the cloud at all, and we're talking hybrid, not moving something that's working today. We'll get to the hybrid part in a minute. The second reason would be, I want to do something today that I'm not able to do. I'm not able to do X or Y, and I want to be able to do it. How do I do that? Okay? And that's when, so somebody comes up to you and says, I have a mobile strategy. I want to be device independent. I want to be able to write code for iOS, for Android, uh, or, or fruits and robots, as we call them at Microsoft, and Windows phones. I want to be able to do that. And once we've written that, I want it to be able to hit the same compute and uh, storage resources around the world. We could do it, but we're not global. So it would take forever for someone in China to hit our servers, and even longer for someone in France to hit our servers, right? They have, that, they have those wires that just don't make it, right? One of those kind of things. All right, that's the, that's the reason to change. The second is the definition of success. I always have a saying, if you don't define success, I succeeded. I ask a company, what does success look like? I, did, I do SQL Server performance tuning all the time. They come in and say, we want to uh, performance tune the SQL Server. What does that mean? Well, it needs to go faster. I don't understand faster. I'm a simple man. 10% faster, 30 seconds, give me a number. So many transactions a minute. And when they give me that, I write it down on the whiteboard. And then every day, we work toward that number. That's success. So you have to define what success means. Because what will happen is, someone will come in and say, I want to sell airline tickets at scale across the globe. Great. We're able to do that. But Marco tried to buy one and couldn't. So, well, that's not success. Sure it is. You sold it to him instead. You said you wanted to sell tickets. You could give a, a, a rat's fanny whether Marco's happy or not, right? That wasn't part of the requirement. That wasn't success, right? And we want Marco to be happy. Well, give him 50 bucks. Marco's happy with very few things. <laughs> you can give him very little. And he's a happy man. Define success. So when you do your project, number one, know why you're doing it. And number two, define what success means. Is everybody with me so far? But then we have constraints. What are constraints? Constraints are things that you can't let happen. Meaning it has to work this way, we can't do that, and so on. Pizza definition. Uh, they had a technical reason. Um, they said, well, actually, believe it or not, that one wasn't technical. It was... Legal reason, they said we don't want Microsoft to be able to look at our credit card data. Our system right now processes credit card data, but we can't make it do that at scale. And so we said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do, what's the hardest part about building a pizza? They were using Flash at the time. Well, you know, the Flash things to put it on there and then pull it from inventory and calculate the route so it gets to the person, that's all heavy lifting. Well, how many people actually click on the credit card and what does it look like, that transaction? It's very small, it's just a few numbers. And all that happens is the system says approved or disapproved and sends it back. So you're saying if I could swallow the word approved or disapproved, that's all that Azure would need to do. That's right. Okay, we can do that. You just continue prep. When they click the button, part of the code shoots it off your way down to the credit card, and the other part takes care of all the heavy lifting. They work together. Hybrid. Broke it apart because of a technical and a legal constraint. Write down the constraints. Make sure you tease them out really well because it doesn't matter. Sometimes constraints are illogical. Nine women can't make a baby in a month. You know what I'm saying? Just add more women to it. Doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that. All right? Trust me. Um, doesn't work like that. There's only so far optimization can go. All right. <clears throat> Everybody comfortable with this? Tiny URLs down here. It's hard to read. 9SJC7J7. Again, you'll get these decks after I'm done. All right, if you can't see something, you guys say, everybody, everybody comfortable so far? Everybody with me? You guys are awfully quiet. There might be financial reasons as well, by the way. Um, you'll always save money if you move something to a hybrid architecture. Notice I'm not saying the cloud. Hybrid can mean Amazon, Microsoft, your own cloud, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. We can argue about the cloud later. The point is, hybrid just means doing things by breaking it apart. Now, notice we haven't even gotten to the actual problem yet. We've just defined the requirements. These requirements are interesting because they're going to 
form the components of what you're going to implement as an architect. All right? Um, but there may be financial. And by the way, it's not cheaper to go to the cloud. Not always. Sometimes it's more expensive. It's really expensive for me to own a car. Super expensive. I buy the car. I pay gas, tires, oil, insurance, license tag, licenses. They raise that every year. Uh, it just get, it's just hideously expensive. No, a car it's stupid. It's not a financial decision, except it gets me to work. And getting to work is important to me at the times that I want to go, so I choose the car. But guess what? When I want to come to Seattle to pass or to sequel in the city, I don't buy a car to do it. I take my car to the airport and get on an airplane. I rent the seat on the airplane long enough to get here. I get here. I rent a taxi long enough to get to my room. And then I take the bus to go to pass, right? Guess what? That's a hybrid decision. And I make it every day. I do it all the time. But not tech. No, no. I'm going to buy a car for everything I do. Every step along the way, I'll buy a car, right? That's the pizza example. All right, everybody with me here? All right, here we go. Step two, define your data source options. This is where you come in. This is where this group comes in. You guys are going to decide where the data lives. You start data first. Everybody with me? We've always started at the other end. We started over here with the code. We lay down some screens. You don't do this. Your developers do. Developers, raise your hand. Everybody writes code? Oh, I'll talk slower. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's all good. Uh, I write code too. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, we start designing a screen. We lay in some boxes and stuff because that's what we do. And we get all our pretty GUIs, and they're awesome. And we have Visual Studio, and you can do mock-ups and unit testing and all these cool things that the DBAs don't get to play with, and it's just awesome. Then when we're done, we click a button, and it gets saved back to a database because we have one, Oracle, SQL, whatever, right? If you're a true, pure developer, you save them in XML. That's the whole world. Is, what is it with developers in XML? Don't get me started. All right. How do we do that? Your first data source option um, is, I'm just going to animate all these real quick so we can talk them through. Um, your data source options, where's my data coming from? You identify where the data is coming from. It may come from your own enterprise systems. Are you saying I need to go list out all of the systems we use on premises? No. And it's on premises, by the way, not on premise. Freaks me out. Premise is a thought. Um, anyway. I'm sorry, it's late. Um, so I go and check all the systems that I have on premises, and I, I just grab my business continuity systems. So do I have to find, we had 2,000 applications at the place I worked at before I came to Microsoft, 2,000 custom applications. I did not go detail each one of those out. I went and found the 10 that would sync our company if they weren't working, okay? Business continuity systems. I define those out. What do they have? Where do they come from and to and so on? We're coming to that. Next, I looked at other data sources that I might stream in from the web. Does your company use um, Dun & Bradstreet data? Do you know? Aren't you the data architect? Aren't you the data admin? Shouldn't you know what data your company uses? Yes, you should. They may use NoSQL. By the way, don't tell the cool kids, NoSQL is just COBOL flat files. Um, <laughs> they got to think they invented something. Um, I was on a plane coming back from Copenhagen, actually, where we saw each other last time uh, over in the UK. And I was coming back, and uh, there was this teenager sitting next to me. I'm playing with Windows 8 on my, my computer. It's a tablet, you know, and I'm playing around. And the kid looks at me, and he goes, um, oh, you, you know, it's pretty cool. What do you guys, Win 8? Yeah, it's Win 8. So I was showing him. And this was before it was out, and uh, we were talking. I work at Microsoft. Oh, you work at Microsoft. Wow, you've been there long. Yeah, I've been in computers a long time. And he's like, um, so what did you guys do before the Internet? That's what he asked me. I said, I don't know. We invented it. What did you do? You little punk. <laughs> punk? Sitting there. Go back to your crazy birds and leave me alone. All right. So we've got, we've got NoSQL data. And NoSQL, by the way, means not only SQL. So key value pair. There are multiple kinds of NoSQL, by the way. Graph databases. Um, there are document databases and others. If you don't know what these are, go learn them. I'm a DBA. I don't care about that NoSQL stuff. Yes, you do. You care about data. You don't care about a platform, you care about data. All right, there may be unstructured data, completely unstructured, document data. And there are document databases where you can completely describe it. In fact, this will blow your mind. In a document databases, there is no data, there's only metadata. 
There's only data about data. And by the time you're done, for instance, when you describe Buck, you're saying this handsome young man with a full mane of hair, flawlessly dressed, critically intelligent, and so on. And that describes Buck. Not there's no single element that makes me up. All right, you get the point. Semi-structured data. You may have data from other sources that you're streaming in. You may be using it and not even know about it. Most of you are already on the cloud, and you have been since the 80s. Did you know that? Your companies have been on the cloud since the 80s. Did you know that? Uh, you use an ADP at all to process your payroll? That software is a service, baby. You just outsourced all or part of your computing being done somewhere else. We used to do payroll in-house. We did it on mainframes. Then PCs were invented, and they said, PCs are awesome. We said, they'll never do anything important on there like payroll. Guess what the first thing that left was? Payroll. I went to PCs. Peachtree, right? And then after Peachtree, everybody said, no one ever used the cloud. Guess what the first thing that left PCs and went to the cloud was? ADP, payroll. Watch where your payroll goes. It's a canary in the mine. You may have data that goes across and uh, based on machine learning. If you have machines that talk to each other, you used to work at a manufacturing firms. We had machines that talked to machines. They interchanged data. If I had some of that data, I could do stuff with it. In fact, I did implement studying what that data was and was able to reduce the cost. I went into this job and the guy said, we don't have a position open. I said, good, I want to make my own position anyway. And I said, here's what I will do. Big company, big gigantic company, 48,000 seats. I want to work for you for two weeks. If I can't save my yearly salary in two weeks, I'll just leave and you don't have to pay for me. But if I can save my salary, I want a job. And he said, okay. So I took a look at their data going across from the machines and saw that they had a failure rate on certain components that they bought. I told them, if you go back and renegotiate with your supplier, they'll give you a better deal because you've got a failure rate of X. He did, they did, they saved the money. Sadly, they saved way more money than they paid me in salary, but you get the point. Here's your uh, tiny URL reference for this one. Questions, defining where your data is. This is all you're doing so far. Step one, where's your data? Everybody got it? Step two. Define your data destination options. First is it could go on premises to whatever you have. So we'll leave that there for the moment. Maybe you've got a security. Remember our constraints? Maybe some of that data stays secure, meaning in-house. Now here's the problem. Um, if you were to ask your bosses how secure should our data be and which parts should be secure, what would they say? All of it, right? Also, these are the same people when you say, how much downtime can we afford to have? Zero. They want an HADR. They want an RPO, RTO of zero. And I'm like, best of luck with that. Um, anyway, they don't want to pay for it, but they want that. You do have an option of putting it on premises with what you have today. Lay that down. Lay its characteristics down. We can put it on disk. We can fund this. Write out all the costs and maintenance associated with that. Tables, as in NoSQL. You could use Azure tables. Azure has these NoSQL tables. And they are not relational tables. They're key value pair, and they can go into terabytes of size with no problem. 200 terabytes, no worries. Okay, Tougher to do inside a regular SQL Server data ta table. You could use a binary large object. How many of you have video in your organization? Some, there's some kind of video, training videos, something like this marketing visual lying, because every one of you does. Every one of you, in some way, has some kind of video in your. Why are you doing that? Why are you handling video? That's got nothing to do with your core value. They have this as a service in Azure and other places. Just get somebody else to do that. We streamed out the London 2012 Olympics. That was done on Windows Azure Media Services. We will encode, transcode, DRM, and stream your video for you. Just throw it out there. Most of that video is public anyway. Right? All right. Um, we have relational database management systems, and not just SQL. You can get MySQL as a service from Microsoft. Did you know that? You should know that. You did know that? Good for you. It, it is sweet, isn't it? It works great. All right. Big data. Ah, big data. What's the definition of big data? What does it mean? How big is big data? How big is big data? Is it, is it a gig? Is that big data? How, how about two gig? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, I've got a definition that's similar. By the way, there's all these really cool computer science-y sounding big data things, which go out of date instantly because big data last year is not big data now and so on. Here's what I say. Mine's similar to yours. 
data that is too big or complex to process in a reasonable amount of time with what you have right now. That's it. So if you got a Commodore 64, big data is a megabyte. <laughs> Am I right? Right? If that's all you got. If you got a mainframe, it ain't too big. You with me? So you had to find out what this even means to you, but basically it means data that's so complicated or large that you're not able to process it all and get an answer back. Now, there's two kinds of that. There's exploratory big data, which I don't believe in, which means I'm going to wander through the sea of data using various tools. I don't understand how that works. Matter of fact, I had a CEO the other day. I came in to talk to him about data analysis. Um, this was actually through the University of Washington, not Microsoft. And he said, if somebody else brings me another tool in here to explore data, I'm going to kick them in the baby maker. Right? He was, he's like, I don't need, I need an answer, not more tools to make me a data scientist. I don't have time. I need an answer. They have something like that. Machine learning techniques can actually boil down data. In fact, some big data techniques allow you to boil down petabytes of data to gigabytes so you can then put it into analytical systems. It's OK. It's hybrid. And do you want to stand up and learn Hadoop? Raise your hand. You want to stand up a, a Hadoop server? OK, bring all your problems to this guy right here. Um, <laughs> or you could rent one. Azure already has a Hadoop cluster. You could throw a hive or a pig job at it. I think what you really want to learn is how to do the hive and pig job stuff rather than standing up the servers themselves. Um, if you really like standing up the servers themselves, give us a call. We'll put you to work in one of the data centers. All right, seriously. Um, but on the other side of that, what you want to do is you want to focus on your problem. So rent it. Rent it. You can get high-performance computing as a service. You can write code that spins off uh, certain kinds of scientific jobs and come back with the answer. Everybody comfortable with this one? Where does, it, where does it come from? Where does it go? We've always just said, oh, OK, well, that means that that goes in this table, and it's this data type, and that goes in this table, and it's this data type. It's not the way it works. The way it works is that you define out the data and find out where it best lives. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, you got to figure out how it's processed. All right, here we go. Define your data processing options. Step three. Let me pull these out. I'm just going to pop all these up. All right. So I no longer care what's going to process the visualization of the data. I just don't care. I'm going to make a big Gozinta and Gozauta. It's an API, an application programming interface. It's a data abstraction layer, DAO. You make a DAO. The DAO is scalable. It's the register. It's the person at the register. It will go get data. It will go insert data. It will go upsert, uh, um, upsert data. It will do all of the things you need to do with data. Each one of them is different. It's not just a SQL statement anymore. Might be for that piece, but it might not. In fact, the one I saw recently, when they send the datum, they describe within the datum that they're sending how they'd like it processed, and it chooses the back end based on that intelligence. For instance, I don't need ACID compliance for this. It's just reading catalog data that doesn't change every week. We'd make a read-only database or table, right? That's what we would do. What this thing did, it said, just store it denormalized in key value pair. Super fast, single run, grab all the data, bring it back. Because that's what that datum required. Now I've manipulated, I want to change it. And when I change it, maybe I don't want to put it back in a table. Maybe I put part of it in a blob. Maybe I put part of it in a table. Maybe I put part of it in XML. And you know what the, this person used the database for? Metadata. Because relational database management systems can have lots of indexes. These other systems can't. So he used nothing but the metadata, the description of where the data is and what it does, as rows. So he had like 2,000 rows of data inside SQL Azure. And then the rest of the actual payload of data was spread out in blobs, and videos were in blobs, and pictures were in blobs, and um, state values were in tables, and so on. Isn't that amazing? Different way of thinking about it. First of all, we can access our physical systems on premises. We've got VMs we can run. These we know today. We do this all the time. Infrastructure as a service. That's a computer, a VM that's running somewhere else. Azure has this, and they not only have Windows ones, they have Linux ones. You can get Linux as well. Okay? I'm talking about Azure because that's what I know. The other cloud providers do the same thing. Right? Platform as a service, what does this mean? Well, this means you write code and store data, and you don't care about the hardware or even the operating system. 
Whenever I talk to a developer and they say, well, we can't use Microsoft stuff because we only work on Linux. That scares me. If you're a developer, you should have no clue what your operating system is, unless you're writing drivers. If you know what your operating system and you care, you're writing very brittle code. You should write Java or .NET or Python or Ruby. You shouldn't care what runs it. You should care that your Python or Java or .NET runs really, really, really well. With me? That's platform as a service. What's software as a service? That's like the Hadoop thing literally, or the Windows Azure Media Services. It's just something that can do that for you. By the way, we're running right now, um, uh, Harry Potter, everybody knows who Harry Potter is. So uh, the lady that wrote that wanted to have Pottermore, which is like a Facebook for Harry Potter uh, fans. That's what it does. So she designed a system, knew that it had to scale tremendously, and so we worked with her. When she tweeted, it's ready, and put a URL down in Twitter, we got 110 million hits on Azure. And then it scales down and back and down and back. Okay? Design a system for me that doesn't, it isn't hybrid that works that way. It's harder to do. But if you'll lay down these rules I'm giving you, this is exactly what we followed to design her system. We had to start with the data. There's a Twitter like feed in there. They got a Facebook like thing where they can chat. Does that need acid? Well, I think some of those people are on acid. <laughs> but I mean like uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Really? Do you really care if the guy's chat got lost or whatever? It doesn't really matter. If it shows up eventually, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. It doesn't need to lock anybody else out from chatting, like this gentleman here who's chatting on Facebook while I'm talking. <laughs> You're not really doing that, though, are you? Yeah. You are. You just tweeted that? Awesome. Buck Woody said I'm tweeting. Ha ha, recursion. Um, <laughs> Next, you need to define your data interactions. What on earth does this mean? How do I get it from one place to the other? Well, you could replicate, and you could use replication, actual SQL Server replication. That's not required. I'm just saying replicate data means take the same data from here, move it over there. Um, there's no such thing as bidirectional replication. It just means you turn around and make a change, and you just replicate from here to here. You're just doing replication twice. It's not bidirectional. It doesn't like see each other as they go by and go, hey, that's my car. It's not like that. All right, here's your URL for that one. You could do synchronization. This is way harder. What this does is it does store like a timestamp so you can marry up things. This is where the um, uh, plane ticket system, if you, take a, if you take a look at a plane system, by the way, like Saber or one of these others, if you look at the way they're architected, that's a hybrid system. That's the ones you should study. Everybody with me? There's also um, consolidation. Maybe I take data from a lot of places and I bring it into fewer places. Okay? Consolidation, I will mention this here, you lose history. Anytime you change data, you're changing fidelity. It's a scientific principle that when we observe an object, it changes the state of the object slightly. If you take a number one from a text file and you put it in a field inside SQL Server that is integer, it has lost fidelity. It's not the same thing as it was when it started. Oh, but it means the same, but it's not the same thing. You need to start getting into that mindset. Every time you tickle the data, you've changed its, its, its uh, integrity. Everybody with me? Sometimes that's fine, but make sure that's true first. Do you need to throw that data away or not? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. All right. Uh, the next thing you might take a look at is integration. Maybe I want to take these three data sources and fold them into another data source that you have that changes the meaning but leaves the original alone. I end up doing this a great deal, where I leave the source systems as they are, but I'll fold them into a different data set. Yes, it does duplicate the data, but it's for a different reason. We do this all the time. All right, considerations here that you need to be careful about when you're moving the data. First of all, security. Where's it going from? Where's it going to? What's its profile? I don't care if you send my name. I don't care if you send part of my social. Fives and tens and fifties go across the web all day. But I don't want you to put my name with my social in clear text, please. You guys control those systems. Don't do it, all right? Be able to figure that out. And I can get very secure on the cloud. You can get super secure, lots of ways to do that. I mean, you need to consider latency and consistency. Um, latency here means how long will it be before the datum reaches this path to this one, and is that one serially depending on it, 
or can it do it in parallel? And if it's in parallel, will it change the meaning? If he sends 50 and you're waiting on showing the current price for the ticket and you get 50 after the 25, is it okay that he's still seeing 50 or 25 before you get the 50? Does that make sense? You need to tease that out and make sure the business understands this because they won't. So you may have to get out, I kid you not, Lego blocks. I've taken Lego blocks to uh, architecture meetings and shown them, see the yellow one comes in and then the blue one? And the manager goes, oh. <laughs> so when they, my manager sees, why do you have Lego blocks on your, on your requirements here for your meetings? And I'm like, it's a long story. Has to do with latency. Um, consistency. Um, consistency, again, means when does everything need to end up at the same? Here's a classic consistency problem. We all know this. We work on this every day. Um, let's assume for a moment we've got, uh, we're taking $50 out of checking and putting it into savings. Assume that's happening. It's not happening at my house because I'm married, so I have no money. My wife handles all that. Um, she doesn't let me hold money or anything or have bank accounts or whatever. But the point is, assume for a moment that I was allowed to have $50. $50 comes out of checking and into savings. It's up. It's really important to me that if it comes out of checking, it goes into savings or I don't want anything to happen, right? Just stay. And the bank wants to make sure that if it goes into savings, that it comes out of checking or don't do it. That's a consistency problem, okay? That one's got very rigid consistency. A tweet does not. You've got more relaxed consistency in your environments than you know. If you tear apart your datum and everything doesn't just go in the database. Is everybody with me so far? Questions here? All right, next thing we need to worry about is the data path and the messaging. I'm just going to pull this real quick. Ba ba ba, ba ba ba, ba ba ba. All right. Um, so once we've defined our source and destination, how does it get there? You have lots of options. One is you could use a service bus. A service bus is the ability to put messages on a system and have it go back and forth. All right. Um, and it guarantees that they'll arrive in a certain order and so on. So that's one option. Azure has two kinds of service buses that you can make use of. If you use some other inferior cloud, they probably have one too. Um, you can ingress or egress the data. Um, by ingress and egress, what I mean by that is you can have some big job that just grabs the data um, in toto and brings it in on a scheduled basis in a batch operation, or you could have something trickle it through in an egress where it's pushed up. Everybody with me? Okay. These are kind of standard um, uh, sort of BI problems, but they're in a bigger, they're writ large. Then we have messaging systems, Azure queues, and service bus queues. Um, a queue is a little different yet again. A service bus is one thing, but a queue is the ability to peek and poke messages. It was as if you know the number five. I could ask you what's the number, you'd say five. You could ask him what's the number, he could say five. And then you could say what's the number, he would say five. And then you'd say, okay, delete the number, right? And then at that point, He's forgotten the five. But until then, it's still five. That can be good or bad. So it's a lights out cue. It's something where I have to say, when I ask you the number, I tell you, go ahead. And uh, I've looked at it. I have the five. Let go. Does that make sense? So cues can be used in that way. I'm oversimplifying here. Tiny URL here. Questions on service path and messaging? All right. Authorization and access control. We have stuff that we want to let people in into Azure. We have data, we have uh, other kinds of data, we have relational and non-relational, and we have code, actual code we want to let people, we're used to securing a table or a view or a stored proc, but not the, not the code itself, but you can. But if I want to do this today, what do I have to do? If I want to make sure I have security around my database, what do I do? Somebody tell me. Hire a consultant. Hire a consultant <laughs> who charges me too much money to do what thing? Create a user. I create a user. I assign the user rights. Everybody with me? Or a role, if you're doing it properly. Of course, none of us are really doing that. We all know that. Um, you're all making them at the user level. Um, I've seen your code. Um, <laughs> that won't scale. Because when I have millions of people logging in, are, do you want to reset a million passwords every other month? Do you want to make sure some guy forgot his password? Do you want to answer that question? No, you don't. You're going to have to federate it. What does federate it means? Assume for a moment, and again, I would never do this, but I'm going to send you to my house. And I'm going to say, uh, this is where I live. Knock on the door and tell my wife uh, to give you my green jacket. And so you're like, cool. So you jump in your car. You drive to my house. You knock on the door. And my wife opens the door. Can I help you? And, and you say, I want Buck's green jacket. What will she say? Who the heck are you? 
who, who are you? Right? Exactly. And that's what she should do. So what does she do? And he says, I'm not leaving. I, I want the coat. Buck said to get the coat. I can't leave. So she's going to call She's going to call me. There's some guy. I'm like, is he like checking Facebook every five minutes? He's, she's like... <laughs> She's like, she's like, yeah, actually he was. And I'm like, uh, it's cool, just give him my jacket. She gives him my jacket, he leaves. A few things happen there, okay? First, does she know who he is still? Does she care? Does she need to be best friends with him? Better not be. Now I know who you're talking to on Facebook. He won't be home for three hours. Um, does she give him anything else? Just the coat, right? What she did was claims-based authentication. She got a claim from me that said he's allowed to see the green coat. That's it. She doesn't have to care who he is. You can write systems like that. There's a little add-in into Azure where when someone tries to attach to an Azure program, Azure will say, I don't know who you are. But in your code, you could say Active Directory, Facebook, Google, Live ID, or even Yahoo ID can send me claims. I trust them to do that. So if he logs in with his authentication into Google, and Google says, yep, it's Bob, and that's all it sends, it's, it's a user I trust. I've written my code to say, if they're in this Google group, they're allowed to get to this discount, let's say. That's the claim that Google will send, not him. The code in Azure has turned him away and ask Google, who is this? And it says, let me check. Makes him log in with his name and password. At no time does Azure give a rat's fanny about the name and password. He does that with Google like he always has. The claim gets sent to Azure, and I go, OK, I don't care who you are, but I know what you're allowed to have. So then that gets sent on. The token gets mailed out, and I'm able to access what I'm allowed to access, and I can give him the green jacket. Everybody with me? You know what's beautiful about this? Devs no longer have to care about security. They say, what do you want me to, to do with this? Yeah, they never have anyway. <laughs> just, just kind of formalizes the whole process. Um, no, the deal here is the, the dev can say, if, it, if I get a claim that this, a verified claim that this is a manager, and it's Friday, and it's after 5, then they can look at this report. Right? That's what the developer, and they're done. They're out. I don't have to let the offshore developers see my, the, my code or anything else. They just need to know if you get this claim, it's all good. Then I go to Google and say, what kind of claims can you give me? And I make sure those things are true. I can ask what time it is. I can ask who he is. I can ask if he's in this group. And then I make him go, everybody's got a division of labor here. So you're with me? Federated security. It's the only way to work. Questions here? Have you heard that described before? Okay, all right, good. All right, here we go. Monitoring management. God bless them. Um, the, the, the admins and the, the DBAs that are not going to change need something to do, so we'll put them on monitoring and management. This is called DevOps. You have multiple ways to do this. You usually have a portal. There are third parties. Hint, hint, guess where we are right now. We're at a Redgate convention. Uh, they're, they're one of the vendors that has monitoring products for Azure. Uh, you're able to use those. Or uh, you can make your own with scripting. Yes, Azure, all of Azure supports PowerShell. How many of you know PowerShell? You better go down and learn PowerShell. I make my students learn. They hate, man, they hate me for doing that. They're doing that this week, and I'm getting more hate mail right now than you can possibly imagine because I'm making them learn PowerShell. Learn PowerShell. Learn PowerShell. Every DBA should learn PowerShell. Every developer should learn PowerShell. Every admin should learn PowerShell. Sorry. It's a CEC, Common Engineering uh, Criteria, at Microsoft. It means anything we write that has a management component must have an interface to PowerShell. You'll never go wrong if you stay in the Microsoft stack by learning PowerShell. Go learn PowerShell. All right. Um, then we take a look here. This is where, actually, I was being flippant a moment ago. This is very important, and the cost-benefit is huge. Um, you literally now, as a technical professional, can show them your salary by saying, you know, if we would just do this. I was in a company not long ago down in California. They use a system that uses telemetrics. It's something that the cloud does very well. What that means is assume each one of these chairs is outfitted with a device that sends back data. Uh, so these, this company happened to do the smart grid around the United States, the power grids. 
Those are actually little IPv6 boxes now, and they do TCP IP over the power lines, which is tray cool, because you know, they're power devices, so they're guaranteed to have power. So anyway, um, these things send back data from all over the place. They never know from when or how much. Perfect example of that elasticity we talked about. So they send it back, it gets processed, and it gets laid down. Um, so they, we were going through their code, they wanted an architecture review, so I was going through their code, and I noticed that they had put the compute function on one area and the storage function in a different geographical area of the US. Fine, common mistake, normal, no big deal, but it now meant the code was having to reach out, it was almost like you put your databases on a share, a network share, in another state. Right, you'd be like, oh, that's gonna slow things down, and it did. So I'm like, oh, watch. We simply clicked a button, one button. It went 10 times as fast for half the cost because it wasn't leaving a data center. One click, one click. You can become someone who saves your company thousands of dollars an hour by knowing your options, by making sure that you take a look at a hybrid architecture. So I'm gonna leave you with this. Through the magic of compression, we'll be done five minutes early. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this tiny URL. This is the one I do want you to write down. Uh, this will go out and it's a full, uh, if this is the one I'm thinking of, uh, this one goes out and there's a full white paper on putting together with all of the decisions I've been talking about, a hybrid system. It's a white paper that's kind of story-like. It's real, they took a real app and they did this. Uh, I can't remember, it's a cat team or somebody did it, um, but it's very good, it's from Microsoft, so it's, it's there. All right, we've talked about a lot today. We've got a process and a procedure to start thinking in hybrid terms. Some things go here, some things go there. Some people will tell you hybrid means on-premises and off. That's just part of the story. It may be multiple kinds of off. I've got people using Amazon, us, and Google all at once, and that's cool. Hey, I, you know, I took a, a taxi to get to one place, to get on a train, to get on a plane, to come here on a boat. Doesn't matter. It's just a mix. Right with me? Questions? Any answers? 42. All right. 42 is always the right answer. Okay, y'all go downstairs and enjoy yourself. Thanks. Oh, fill out them forms, too, and they'll give you stuff. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, my brother.